Behold, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. John the Baptist, he looked every inch an Old Testament prophet, and he could command the attention of thousands and crowds so great gathered from every part of Judea and Galilee to hear him preach. His message was not humanly an attractive one. He told the people of their sin. One of his tasks was to prepare the people for the coming of Christ. And he would preach and bring them to tears and to conviction. And thousands of people were baptized by John and no doubt his disciples. And even among the leaders of the people, the proud, proud scribes and Pharisees, even they were compelled to come. You could say he commanded the nation, but he had one supreme task, and that was to announce the beginning of the earthly ministry of our Lord Jesus Christ, come from glory, from heaven, born a man, now as a man, he begins to heal and to preach. And John, it fell to him the terrific privilege of announcing the beginning of that era. And he did so, surrounded by his disciples, with the crowds building, and I'm sure moved by the Spirit of God. He knew the moment had come, and he saw Christ, Jesus of Nazareth, approaching, and he lifted up his voice, and I'm sure even that mighty voice trembled with emotion when he uttered these words. Behold, look, look, see. And what did he say? The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. How many ways John might have introduced Christ to the crowds. He could have spoken of him as the one prophesied, indeed the only person ever to be prophesied in the history of the entire world was Jesus Christ the Lord. No one else has ever been prophesied. Oh, people say, there have been those who have been prophesied. No, only mythical people vaguely prophesied. Only one real person has ever been prophesied. Prophesied not once, but over centuries. Prophesied not vaguely or generally, but in detail how he would come where he would come, who he would be, what he would do, how he would live, how he would die, how he would be raised again. Everything explicitly spelled out. Surely John could have mentioned that. The one in our scriptures, by the lips of our prophets of old, so long prophesied, but he doesn't utter a word of that. He could have said, behold, the one who is about to begin miracles you've never seen, mighty miracles, raising the dead, restoring the leper, restoring sight to the blind, calling into life people whose limbs have been withered for years and years so that they can walk and run restoring speech to the dumb. So many things, thousands were healed in the records of the Gospels. Thousands in every town, every village, everybody knew somebody who'd received this touch of power from Christ. Not a word. He could have described him as the Holy One, unblemished, who would never be seen in temper, in cruelty, in deceit, 
never be charged or chargeable with any offence. He could have spoken of him in any number of ways. And his preaching, no one ever spoke like this man, said the authorities sent to arrest him. We cannot take him. He holds the multitudes spellbound. Nobody can challenge his words. The cleverest of the scribes and the Pharisees desperately try to ensnare him and trip him, and he answers them all, and they're reduced to silence. Nobody is as articulate as this man. He could have said so many things about Christ and how his life would unfold and what he would do, but he chooses one, or the Spirit of God chooses it and puts these words into his mouth. Behold, the sin-bearer, the one who will go to Calvary's cross, the one who will suffer and die for sinners. Why that? Because that's the greatest event in the universe ever, that God should come from heaven and Christ should atone for the sins of all who believe in him. So I look at this briefly. These words, behold, it's a five-heading message in a simple verse from John the Baptist. Behold, and I want to start with this word. Look, the way it's put in the original Greek makes it so important. It's not a casual, look over here and see this. This is a dramatic very emphatic, look, you haven't been looking. This is something you don't know about. This is something you would never have thought of. This is something entirely unexpected. This is something astonishing. This is the greatest thing you can ever see. It's that kind of look. Behold, that's why it's translated with that ancient word. Behold, it's a big word. It's a gigantic look. Your teenager friend, young man, young woman, this world is everything, this world is great, all your heroes are here, all the things you're interested in, no time for God, no time for Christ, no time for heaven, for the soul, this world is everything, you're not looking. It's John the Baptist with great kindness and forcefulness. He says, look, look at this. This is vastly higher than anything you've ever looked at in life so far. This is everything. This is eternal. Look at this person. In him is life and hope and eternity. In him is heaven, forgiveness of sin, all the power of God with you and in your life. Look at this, something unknown to you, something unexpected by you. A savior has come to die for sinners, to release you from sin's bondage, to bring your soul to life, to bring you to walk with God. It's a tremendous look. Wake up, be amazed, consider. Contemplate, examine, think of things that have meant nothing to you before. When I was a youngster, I was like this. These things meant absolutely nothing. This present world, for all its glories and pleasant things, was all in all and everything to me. And I never listened to anything spiritually. It didn't matter. I needed this kind of statement to come penetrating right through me. Look, open your eyes and see reality and the purpose and the meaning of everything. So that's John the Baptist. Behold, look at him, the most important and the most significant person ever born. He cannot be seen by you if you're vague and indifferent and careless 
or proud, too proud to depend upon God and to seek him. You never see anything in him. There's an old story that uh, the youngest prime minister ever, William Pitt, was taken by William Wilberforce, whose name you know in connection with the abolition of the slave trade. He was taken one day to hear John Newton, the ex-slave trader who became a preacher, preaching at St. Mary Woolnoth in the city where he was the rector. And William Pitt sat fidgeting throughout the sermon. And William Wilberforce was bowled over and amazed at the wonderful things that he heard because he loved the Lord and he walked with Christ. And after the service was over, William Pitt said to Wilberforce, what do you see in that man and that message? He was a brilliant man, but he couldn't see anything because he was proud and because he was all bound up with this life and because he was shut in and limited and cramped into this narrow little human earthly material life. So the first word of John the Baptist, behold, is a word of kindness to break through to us, to look at Christ, to consider these great things. Well, listen, behold what? Second, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. The Lamb of God. Now, that may not at first mean so much to us, but to the Israelites in those days, it made a, meant a great deal. The Lamb of God, it was a great symbol in national life. You know that when the Israelites were delivered from slavery in Egypt centuries before, Pharaoh would not let them go. And you may remember how Moses pleaded with Pharaoh at the command of God to let the people go. But Pharaoh and his cruelty and his obstinacy would not release the Israelite slaves. And so God sent the plagues upon, is, upon Egypt, ten in all, one after the other, to break the stubborn will of Pharaoh and the Egyptian overlords. Well, the last plague was going to be a terrible plague because Pharaoh wouldn't yield and the children of Israel were instructed, all their families, on the night of the plague, the last plague, the night before their deliverance, when Pharaoh would relent and let them go, broken by the final plague, they were commanded to take a lamb every home and to sacrifice the lamb as a symbol for the forgiveness of sin. And you remember how they had to daub the blood of the lamb on the lintel of the door of the home and on the sides, the doorposts. And every home that was protected by the blood of that sacrificial lamb, the angel of the Lord passed by and plague, the final plague did not strike that family. And sheltering under that blood, the people were delivered. And the next day, they went out, out of Egypt with a high hand. Well, friends, the Exodus. But here, John says something very strange. Behold, the Lamb of God. All those sacrificial lambs represented, symbolized the real lamb, Christ, who would come in apparent meekness for all his power to voluntarily give himself up to be the sacrificial lamb for all who trust in him. 
So the Jews knew what it meant. Behold, the one and only, as only one, as only one son of the living God, the Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. O oh, Christ came in meekness. You think of his power, his miraculous power, his preaching power. He had divine power, and yet he assumed humility, and he allowed himself, when the time came, to be arrested and taken and bound and tried and nailed to a cross and tortured, and God the Father put upon him all the guilt of the sins of those who would be forgiven and punished him with everlasting punishment, compressed into six hours instead of us. The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin of the world. Quickly, third heading, which taketh away the sin. I'll deal with taketh away in a moment. The sin. Sin is your great enemy. Sin is your problem. The problem of every one of us. Sin has been described as the heaviest thing in life. And it is. In the news, we sometimes see of great mudslides and floods and rocks hurling down hillsides, burying roads and houses, avalanches also, that illustrates sin. It's a great mass of guilt. Every sin you've ever committed blocking your life, blocking the way to heaven. Imagine you're out in the early hours and you're driving down a winding country lane and you're in a hurry, but you turn a corner, it's been very stormy and there's a massive tree across the road. You have no hope of shifting that. You can only turn round and wind your way back and find another way. Your route is blocked. Sin, friends. All the homage we haven't paid to God. No gratitude to him. No love for him. No worship of him. No service of him. No study of him. And all the sins we've actually committed Every lie, one lie will send us away from God forever. How many lies have we told? How many acts of selfishness? How much cruelty? How much lust? How much evil speaking and thinking? So much sin, so much guilt, and God is holy and perfect and hate sin, and his anger, his wrath, that is his indignation, is against sin. There's no hope for us unless a saviour comes. Only God himself can take away the sin by suffering and dying, by assuming a body and a human personality and taking our place and suffering my lies, my pride, my selfishness, bearing away the punishment on my behalf. The Lamb of God, which taketh away the sin, the mass of mud, no, the mass of foul sewage, which lies between me of God and God, my guilt, but taketh away, it's a beautiful term, which taketh away. Do you know what it is literally in the Greek? Which lifteth away. 
that tremendous weight, the tree across the road, the avalanche that would bury you and block your way to any safety, the mudslide, the guilt of sin. Christ personally is ready to take it away, to suffer and to bear it, to lift it from your shoulders. It's a great burden. Your sin will weigh you down every minute of life. Every one of your sins will gradually, as life goes on, become a perversion so that you can't free yourself from it. You can't stop lying. You can't stop being selfish. You can't stop being proud. You can't stop being cruel, even to those who love you. The terrible nature and the weight and the ugliness of sin, only Christ can shatter it and lift it away so that I can live a better life by his help, so that I can please him, so that I can be a kinder person, a generous person, a forgiving person, a loving person, a person with real integrity. Oh, help us, Lord. Take away our sin and bless us and change us and make us new people. That's what it is to become a believer in Christ. Finally, friends, behold the Lamb of God which lifteth away the sin of the world. The world. The Jews had to learn that. Many of them thought this was just for Israelites, doesn't it? It's for all Jews, all Gentiles, all nationalities. Christ has come into the world to save people throughout the world of every land and nation, living in every age. He is the Savior. But not of everyone. Every nationality people of every kind, men and women, aged people, boys and girls, toddlers who can understand, but not everyone. If Christ dies for someone and bears away their sin, their sin is forgiven, their sin is gone. What if I never believe in him? What if I never seek him? What if I never care about him? Never want him? Never know him? He didn't die for me. And when I breathe my last, there'll be that terrible barrier of guilt between me and God, between me and heaven, and I shall be consigned because the soul goes on forever to everlasting loss and punishment. How do you know if Christ died for you? How do you know if the man of love came from heaven out of love for millions and millions, including you? Throughout the world, so many people will be saved in the history of the world? Will it include you? Did he die for you? How will you know? Here's how you'll know. Here's how I'll know if he died for you. If you're one of those people who feel your great need of him. You feel your need of a saviour. I need the forgiveness of Almighty God. 
I need Christ to have died for me. I need my sins to be washed away, lifted away. I need a new life. I need to be made new. I need to be put on the road to heaven. I need to be brought to know the Lord. Lord, forgive me. If you're one of those who says, Lord, forgive me my sin. I'm so ashamed of my sin. I am the person who sinned away my life and I haven't cared of thee or wanted thee. I've lived as though I made myself and I'm entitled to everything just for me and what I want. Lord, forgive me. Lord, change me. Lord, let me find thee. Lord, make me new. Bring me one day to heaven. If you're one of those and all that comes into your heart and you cast yourself at him and you give your life to him and you call upon him and pray him for, to him, then you may be absolutely sure that he died for you. Behold, the Lamb of God, which lifteth away the sin of millions and millions throughout the world in every age who come to him and depend upon him. That's what the scripture everywhere teaches us. John the Baptist, I'm sure his voice trembled and he lifted it up and he longed for the people to be converted. And all he could be say was, look, look at the Lamb of God, God's sacrifice for sin. He made the world and yet he in love was ready to give himself for us and then he returned to heaven and from on high he receives sinners and hears their prayers behold the lamb of god that which taketh away the sin of the world let's pray together O oh god our gracious heavenly father Look upon us now, draw needy souls to thyself, awaken those who have slumbered and slept and disregarded thee. O oh Lord, in great and amazing mercy, come and deal with each one of us and save now. We ask these things in the name of Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.